Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes, an Iron Skills podcast about you, the heroes of cybersecurity. You're about to hear and learn practical and experiential knowledge in our conversations with CISOs, security directors and architects, SOC analysts, and other InfoSec stars so we can become more cyber resilient and safer together. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to today's panel on insider threats. Uh, I'm joined today by Daniel Stigman. Daniel is a subject matter expert in individual, organizational, and technical threats that seek to exploit vulnerabilities. With an extensive range of experience in advising, identifying security threats, hunting for illicit actors, managing analytical projects, and instructing intelligence professionals. We're also joined by Mark Sangster, cybersecurity expert and author at eCentire. Mark is a cybersecurity evangelist who has spent significant time researching and speaking to peripheral factors, influencing the way that legal firms integrate cybersecurity into their day-to-day -day operations. Mark has also released his own book called The Inside Truth About Cybercrime and How to Protect Your Business. And last but not least, we have E.J. Hilbert, former FBI cyber agent, CISO and founder of KCE Cyber. E.J. has spent 25 years plus in the security arena. He has served as an FBI agent, the head of security enforcement for MySpace, a CISO, and ran his own online investigation firm. He has given over 200 presentations on cybersecurity and attack methodologies in 10 different countries. Hey, welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, all. <laughs> <laughs> so we have no shortage of uh, cybersecurity experience here today. Uh, so let's get into the show. Um, I would love to open up with what is an insider threat and can we debunk uh, some of the common myths around insider threats? Mark, you want to jump on that? Yeah, sure. I'll start off. So I think everybody sort of sees insider threats as, you know, some kind of Jason Bourne, like um, espionage based type of issue. And, and while that can be the case, in many cases, it's simply not right. It's abuse. It's misuse. It's misunderstanding. Um, and I think it's also has a narrative um, aperture opening. So it sees insider or we talk about insider threats in terms of employees and we don't necessarily think about their spouses, for example, or even employees of vendors and anybody else within our ecosystem. Yeah, I would jump in and say that one of the things to, to Mark's point is that when we talk about insider threats, usually we're, we're talking about, uh, like you said, employees or like even um, the cleaning people who come in and sneak in in the middle of the night and take stuff out of our computers. But what we've seen, even with like the solar winds type of approach, a vendor, a trusted vendor that you rely on and believe is going to share uh, or is going to do the right thing before sharing information with you is also an insider threat um, because they are inside of your realm or your trust bubble. How's that? That's a better way to put it. And if, if, if they're inside that trust bubble, um, we give them a little more leniency um, and we don't dig as deeply into it. So that's kind of the, the, the world here. And then we should also mention that they're not always malicious. Sometimes they're unintentional threats that we just don't even know happens. It's like the kid bringing the peanut butter sandwich to school and not knowing that everybody around him is, is allergic to peanut butter. And they didn't intend to do it. It just happens that way. So... That's right. Or they get used as a pawn, right? So they don't understand what's actually going on, right? They don't understand the end game or the outcome that the, whoever the, the threat is, is that actors is trying to accomplish and they just think they're doing their job. They're helping out whatever it is. Uh, Daniel, did we miss anything? No, that, that's a pretty good wrap on that for, for sure. Um, like I said, trust and relationships are a big thing. Uh, that's the one of the things that makes the big difference between insider threat and external is that we're giving them the asset, we're giving them the access, and that trust relationship. And we just think everything is good, and it leaves the room for complacency. Yeah. All right. Just a quick pause. Uh, Daniel, your audio is a bit soft. Are you able to turn up the mic? I can try another headset. Can we do that real quick? 
Yeah, that's good though where you were at right there. You just you just broke up for a little bit. I think it was part of the uh the video feed as well. So staying okay. off video and keeping the audio on works, I think. Yeah. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, You want to just repeat what you said, and then we'll go to the next uh, question. <laughs> yeah, uh, insider threat. Uh, <laughs> we 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 definitely give ourselves. Um, it's a lot of different from the external, where we uh, give them the asset, we give them the access, and we trust that they're going to do the right thing, and uh, that leaves a lot of room for complacency uh, for us in the security posture, and opens them up for opportunity. Right. Yeah. And maybe just to set the stage and uh, for, for our audience who may not be super familiar with this topic, could you guys kind of break down the different types of insider threats? Different types of insider threats. Um, well, since we just looped them all together into anybody that we trust, uh, that, that's <laughs> kind of it. Um, look, in the in the easiest approach, um, and I'll let Mark run down the types um, since he's got his books and everything. That uh, <laughs> look, it's to that point. It's anybody that you trust that you are providing access to, or is or is receiving access through that trust environment. To the to the point, um, my kids using my computer become an insider threat because it's my computer and they have trust. It's a, it's a trust, it's extended trust bubble beyond. Um, there, to say there's a true type is, in my opinion, is incorrect. Because if you, if you categorize it into a type, you're categorizing it into a type of way to fix it. Anybody that you trust or anybody that gains access into your system that you're not watching over their shoulder or that you don't have a clear view of what's happening is considered an insider. Um, because they are already inside your your perimeter walls, your protection. Uh, yeah, that. Go ahead, Mark. So that's a great that's a great way of describing it, right? So, I mean, I think there's some stereotypes, I guess, that we could say, right? So, like I said, most people think about the saboteurs or the turncoat, right, or someone who's being extorted because maybe they have a gambling, you know, habit. And now somebody's saying, well, I can use that. Uh, you know, to, to sort of bend them to my will, right? So they're they're using their privilege, privilege to access information and they're doing it for personal financial gain or ideological gain or something like that. And I, I also mentioned, you know, the kind of the pawns, right? The employees who um, have no motive, but who accidentally or inadvertently assist adversaries. And they're doing this unknowingly, right? They don't really understand what they're doing. And that can be as simple as somebody saying, hey, you know, I wasn't able to access this file, but my boss is, you know, yelling at me because I have to do something. Would you mind like, you know, decrypting it or, or, you know, making a copy and sending it to me. Um, but I think there's a few others that, that those are the ones that have kind of, in some cases have manifested in the last year with work from home, like the cowboy, right? So that's the employee who has no malicious intent, but violates policy because, you know, they're a get the job done kind of person. So they're the ones, you know, throwing files up on Dropbox, <laughs> right? To share when they shouldn't be. Um, but I actually think the biggest one that we always ignore is the executive uh, owner slash rainmaker, whatever you want to say, right? The senior player in the company who, because they have rank, um, demands that they have unnecessary administrative privilege or access to sort of non-functionally required information, right? Um, and they're super dangerous because, of course, they're you know they're the ones who can be fished, and when they're fished, right, they're the top of the food chain, and they're the ones who have that unparalleled access, and that's a real problem. And of course. EJ, you nailed it with, you know, partner vendor supply chain, anybody else that you've, you know, let into that bubble. Yeah. I, I like uh, breaking Throw it over up. To Daniel, into, but... Yeah, sorry. Uh, Non-hostile. No, uh, you can think of like reckless insider, harmful insider, uh, associated uh, vendor partner, kind of where you were just talking about. And you got a hostile section. These are kind of like, yeah. you know, the upper tier, you know. Disgruntled insider, compromised, hostile insider, maybe organized crime, uh, you know, things things of that sort. Uh, one of the ones I like is the architect engineer level guys who develop things and, and maybe they think of their stuff as intellectual property. And they meet, hey, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to take this with me. And sometimes you get guys that are in uh, places where the mentality is it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission 
And so they'll use a tool they're not supposed to use. They'll, they'll, uh, do something kind of a shortcut to circumvent security and you got yourself a problem. Yeah. I'll jump on that. I had a, 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 a case back when I was with the FBI where an individual who did in fact create, create this, uh, methodology as it related to a to building uh, semiconductors it was his job to build it up and everything of that nature he left the company and took it with him as, as well as the uh, series of spreadsheets and information that he had created to identify what the cost breakdown was everything of that nature and he believed that he actually had the right to it and the company i won't say their name got in touch with us as the FBI. We were able to track the guy down, get to him before he actually started his new job at a rival to it. And the rival company didn't even see it. But when it came to court, this is what was interesting. The first question that was asked by the judge in terms of whether or not this was a violation of the law and so on was, what did you do to protect it? What, did, what steps did you take to make sure that this piece of intellectual property was protected from people like this gentleman taking it, people like other groups taking it, and so on. And when they couldn't actually answer that question, when they couldn't showcase that they had taken real steps, it became a problem. And that it goes that ties into the insider. Because once you become an insider, we don't take steps to necessarily protect against them or against you from it. I mean, it's the whole concept of zero trust as you move forward, the, the uh, you know, um, trust but verify approach to the world. So it's, you know, Daniel brings up a great point about those those individuals who build this and create this. PayPal, when they sold, one of the individuals who was with PayPal, who was one of the original group that created it, actually took the whole source code with him and returned back home to to Russia uh, because yeah. he was a student at, in, in uh, Illinois, a, a Russian uh, exchange student, took the whole code. There's nothing they could do about it. So and now you've got an insider that has a whole insight of how this company works. So it's a lot more convoluted. It doesn't fit into your original question, though, Brendan, of a type. It's just individuals that have access. And, and I also read an article, like, I think it was a year or plus more ago, uh, in healthcare, you know, um, patient records were selling on the dark web for around 400 bucks uh, mm -hmm. a pop. So that's also a, another challenge. And I don't know how you solve for that, but <laughs> that's a pretty, ch pretty ch uh, chunk of change. <laughs> well, you, you nailed it though. When we're, we've all talked about insiders as being, well, quasi comes across as being technical people, right? Um, but the guy working in the mailroom, the nurse who's yeah. solving X, Y, or Z issue. Um, this is not a, it's not a tech issue. Uh, it's a, it's a person issue. Guys jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm hogging it here. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no that's a great point. I mean, there's uh Deja Dan, right? This is publicly available. Go ahead, Daniel. No, no good there. <laughs> okay. Mark, Sorry then that. Daniel, go Mark. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's got a referee here. Yeah, so a couple <laughs> of years ago, right, there was the Dejodan, uh story, right, the insurer, who, and it was uh, a sort of a, a mid-level employee who stole over 4 million um, customer records, right, and took them with them. And, you know, that's that's that kind of classic event where, you know, that person really had access to information and the capability to do that. Um, when he certainly shouldn't have. And of course, you know, I think the unfortunate thing in that was when that event occurred, you know, the, the management of the company came out and said, oh, well, it was a bad actor, you know, it was a bad apple. And, you know, you're always going to get one in, in the bunch kind of thing, um, which completely, of course, lets them off the hook in, you know, any sort of responsibility they had in that to say, well, why aren't you using any, you know, there should have been defenses for that kind of thing, right? That's the sort of thing that should flag in a logging system that behavioral analytics would pick up like, wow, nobody did that, or somebody just did a dump out of your CRM, um, typically alert somewhere, right? And somebody could do a fast check on that because that's probably not something they do on a daily basis. And I think that's the big problem is to some degree, like I said, that it's like the get out of jail free card for the executive who just go, oh, well, you know, it was a, it was a criminal. So, you know, well, hey, we're, you know, we're the victim here. And it's like, well, you know, it's, I don't think it's that simple. Yeah, we should come back to that. But Daniel, go ahead, because I want to talk about that, uh, whose real uh, responsibility it is uh, on some of this, too. But Daniel, you were going to say something mm -hmm. before Mark. 
Yeah. Um, it's amazing how we have this term called every, every person's an asset, right? Uh, I won't say where I was and I won't say who it involved except for the, um, the young private who came up to me and said, Hey, I have this thing I want you to look at. And I won't tell you what year either. I'll just leave it at that. And he says, you know, I found this thing on the internet that's cruising around, and this is probably important information that we should know about, uh, that, that somebody has got, got out here on, on uh, this or that, put it out there in the ether. And I said, uh, yeah, that's pretty important. It has a great impact. We should uh, definitely bring this up. And it was just some young, you know, 18, 19-year-old uh, service member who was sitting there going, cruising around the internet in the middle of the night, you know, and, and, and I, I think that's when we give so much trust to employees or people within our organization, uh, we should also educate those who are out there, not for just for deterrence or anything like that, but educate them and say, Hey, this is what we need to be, be looking for. What, what is poor behavior? And the thing is, is that the main point is we have all these rules for us, SOP, uh, you know, m- you know, morality, legal reasons that we have to follow. What does the insider threat or anybody that that's uh, doing you know criminal acts have to do? They don't have any rules. They don't follow it. So it's a lot harder for easier for them to do what they got to do. A lot harder for us to do what we got to do. So, yeah. C- can I ask a question? I'll throw it back out, and um, because Mark, you touched on it, the responsibility of protecting against. Um, insider threats and you know when when a client or or a company says oh it wasn't me you know it was a bad actor on the outside i mean when do we start holding management responsible i guess is a better way to put the question because uh you know even the recent pipeline shutdown thing or even the blocking of the suez canal thing whatever you want to call it when do we hold management responsible for this type of security, um, and especially when we're talking about something like this. Mark, I'm throwing it yeah. at you. <laughs> yeah, that's that. so that's a great question. And I think, you know, surprisingly, you probably would have expected more heads to roll than have. So like in Capital One's another good example where after the 110 million uh, credit card records and applications had been stolen, you know, and it was sort of a, oh, well, we misconfigured a, you know, a firewall. Well, it turned out there was a heck of a lot more going on, right? Like board cuts to um, the cybersecurity team and all sorts of, you know, alerts and sort of, you know, um, flagging about about gaps in their security program, which, you know, were more than more than ignored, right? So the reality is, though, I think regulations are too slow. Um, and honestly, I think this could come, you know, if we flip this around, so supply chain's a risk, but at the same time, depending on where you play, maybe that's where we need to see this, right? So things like um, procurement penalties in manufacturing, transportation, utilities, et cetera, right? If you're down, if you violate that SLA, you start paying financially. For insurers, I think as well, carrying either business disruption insurance, E&O insurance, or cyber insurance, you know, to start mandating specific security requirements. And when those aren't met, your policy is valid, you know, invalid, right? It's just like your auto insurance. If you say you don't speed and, you know, you have no whatever, you know, tickets and it turns out, you know, you drive like you're in a Formula One race or the Indy 500 that's coming up, um, you know, then, you know, you're not going to be covered anymore. And, you know, I think those kind of practical business penalties are probably the thing that's going to get the attention of that board to actually, you know, to invest. Otherwise, you know, I think they look at this and they go, well, you know, why am I going to pay for all this security? Because it's not going to stop it. And, you know, and it, and it doesn't matter anyway. I've got insurance. And for the listeners, I mean, Capital One was an insider through a trusted source. I mean, they had access to the yeah. the Amazon web environment. But what that one thing was actually showcasing a bunch of other problems that existed down the road. And again, right. management said, oh, it was an insider They or this was a bad actor that did this type of stuff without actually yep. taking responsibility for the, let's call it a business risk across the br- approach, because this isn't an IT thing anymore. Absolutely. Um, Daniel, did I miss anything on that one? No, I think I think that uh, there's issuing guidance, knowing uh, at, at an operational level what you need to do in leadership. Uh, let's say it's training on fishing. I mean, what? how, how many attacks start just by fishing? Is fishing considered an insider insider threat? 
because you got your guy running, clicking the mouse and not, you know, not reading the email. I, I consider it, uh, within that category, um, giving that a leader, if he goes to you and says, I want access to everything. I want to see it all. I want access to this machine at any time and all these tools, it, it becomes an issue because you're like, no, why do you need it? Is, is it part of your role? Is it part of your task priority? If it's not, then you don't need it. The same thing with clearances within the, you know, the three layer industries and, and everything like that. If you don't need the access, you're not going to get it. And I, locking that down is an important thing for leadership to do. Brendan, other questions that we haven't touched on? Yeah, I would, I would say, what are some of the early indicators of an insider threat that one could look out for? Daniel, start with that one. Yeah, email, chat, talking to somebody, be disgruntled. You know, hey, he pissed me off. You know, there's, there is, uh, I think we touched on this when we talked before. There is digital indicators and there's behavioral indicators. Can you, can you log and capture any kind of behavioral indicators? Hell yeah. Like I said, go to the emails, go to the message messaging, uh, messages that they pass around amongst employees. Um, maybe they're showing up late and we used to do this thing where we would look for three types of indicators, uh, in it, it, it for, for any kind of insider threat. And it could be maybe their financial personal financial issues. Um, it's, it, it's the warming of the oven before the insider threat takes action. Uh, when you're looking at my attack framework, a lot of people don't look at pre-attack because sometimes we don't think of the human component and how much that plays into, into the, uh, the, uh, life cycle of the threat. So I think, I think that's what you need to look at. And to yeah, your... definitely. Oh, go ahead. Nope. Go back. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, definitely. There's, um, as you say, I mean, behavioral kind of indicators, I think you're right. There's the digital one and the human ones, right? Like morale and temperament and tardiness and so on. Um, behavioral changes, you know, things like volume, you know, the volume of, of data that they're accessing, uh, time of day, right? You know, they don't typically work and now suddenly they're, you know, they work nine to five and now they're working at 2 a.m. Access to unusual content or asking for shared credentials. I mean, wasn't that, wasn't that part of Snowden's gig, right? Where he didn't have access to certain information. He'd He'd sort of, uh, I wouldn't say coerce, but he could charm the individual into, you know, effectively surrendering it and getting it, getting him access to it. Um, you know, there's, I guess, there's the extreme things, asking for payday loans or raises based on, you know, personal financial crisis might be an indicator that's, go that's going to happen. Um, but I think the big ones are more that, you know, if they start asking for shared credentials or tasks to be completed by a peer, right, like a download of content, access to content systems, et cetera, that they don't need to perform their functions, um, you know, I don't think there's one silver bullet that indicates what's going on, but I think there are significant behavioral um, items that you can identify. And when you sort of see a cluster of them uh, and, you know, that stands out above the baseline, right? The rest of the marketing employees are not accessing the financial servers, but this one person is, um, you know, there might be a reason to find out why they're doing it. Maybe something that they require, you know, they do need for their job. There's a change in their, in their role uh, or, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're standing tall and on that one. And that's something you should take a deeper look at. And, and all the things that we've just talked about there, Brandon, are if it's a, let's call it an, an intentional individual. Um, but you, those things can also apply to the unintentional individuals. What I mean by that is the, the CEO's account that's being used at two o'clock in the morning, that's never used at two o'clock in the morning or being accessed from IP addresses that don't matter. Um, chats that are, are, are occurring from individuals that don't normally chat, uh, emails that are coming from individuals that don't normally email, uh, things that you don't, you, you just don't normally see. And then if you're talking about, if you extend it out to your vendors or groups of that nature, odd updates to systems or requests for updates to systems at odd times, changes in the way that those systems start to communicate to outside sources. Um, because look, you should be logging all of this from a technical perspective. You should be logging and being able to see some of this. And if you don't have a sock that's doing it, if you've got a junior individuals looking at it, anything that looks weird. I mean, in law enforcement, it's called a JDFR. It just doesn't feel right. 
Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, the little things that make the, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Um, the other thing that I thought I want to throw in here, though, is when you start looking into people personally, because we're in an environment now that we may be peers and we may work together, but we don't know their personal life. And if you start questioning somebody's personal life and going on a mole hunt, looking for a bad guy, nine times out of 10, there's no bad guy. There's no mole. All right. And all you end up doing is screwing up the company. Um, so there's <laughs> got to be a proper balance here. It is not your job to, you guys are too easy or too young for it. Mark and I might get this. The, the Mrs. Kravitz across the street looking in the window of everything going <laughs> on um, as every yeah. car drives by. And those of you who don't know it, look it up. But um, it's not your job to be the busybody looking at everything. It's your job to, if you see something that just is a little off, report it to the security team whose job it is. Report it to people like, like Daniel's group who's responsible for doing this type of stuff in his company. Um, and let them run with it. Uh, our problem is we get, we all want to be investigators at times and, and we end up causing more, more, more bad than good. So other and, things, and Brendan? Daniel, yeah. And, and Daniel, I know you, you talked about designing a framework around this. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to share your screen, but if you want, you want to, to up, share you get, your, are you able to do it? your design, we, we can talk through, yeah, we can talk through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for the younger folks, the, the Dwight Schrute from the office that he, he was talking about, the guy, the guy who, who always acts like he's a cop and wants to put out fires. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and that's pretty much every IT person, junior IT person who gets into it. Everybody who says, I want to get into cybersecurity, and they think, oh, it's so sexy because I'm going to be chasing hackers and so on. Um, <laughs> I kicked in the doors, okay, guys? I've arrested the people. I've been, I've been hit and beat and kicked and spit on and all the other stuff. And that's this much of the job, all right? In law, in law enforcement, this much of the job is writing paperwork and and putting everything together and and looking at it that one um and yeah it's fun at times and the adrenaline goes through the roof but you know that's once every six months it's not an everyday thing so um mm. just just be aware that you know it's not like tv i i can't hack a, a a supercomputer in five minutes uh or even three seconds if you're watching certain shows um and and you know cybersecurity is a lot more about understanding threats, risks, approaches, and building security that way. So, Brendan, if you have the, uh, the matrix and you want that uh, Daniel created and you want to pull it up on your screen, that would be easier because given his, his bandwidth. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let me know if you can see it. And then, Daniel, you can just walk through sure. it. Yep. There we go. It's up. All right. Oh, one second. It's in your email, though. <laughs> <laughs> One sec. I was going to say while you're all those that listeners, off, uh, I knew do the, not, a, I knew the do guy. not pay attention to anything you just saw. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, let, I, uh, let me try I that again. These are not the droids you're looking for. These are. Go ahead. I was, I was part of the Chicago Let's Terrorism Liaison Officer How, com oh, Committee when yeah. I was uh, yeah. um, long, a long while back. And uh, there was the two people on the. Department of Homeland Security, who actually broke in the door and arrested Jeremy Hammond, I believe it was. Um, do you remember him? And just talking to him, you realize these guys are computer guys. They're, they're not kicking down the door. And for the first time, they got, you know, stacked up on the door and getting ready to go in there. And uh, I bet their heart was going because they've never, <laughs> I don't think they've done that too many times. They definitely weren't going to kick the Never door down. Never done that. Let me put that put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that Brandon showed this, but I'll I'll share this real quick. My first time kicking in a door. Half the guys on my squad were SWAT guys, so they're all big, bad, burly, whatever. They're like, EJ, you're new. Go ahead, kick in the door. So I come up. I think I've got it. I kick, and nothing happens. And I kick, and nothing happens. <laughs> and it's a steel frame door. 
All right. And what it ended up taking, <laughs> to be honest with you, we even brought in a locksmith to drill the lock. It still wouldn't pop. We had one of the SWAT guys kick the middle of the door and one of the guys, SWAT guys half a second later kick the um, where the locking mechanism is. And because of mm -hmm. the bow that was created, that's the only way the door popped open. Otherwise, <laughs> we wouldn't have gotten in. So, um, yeah. And your heart's beating. And anyways, enough of that. Go ahead. You got to. Uh, Sure. What do we got here, uh, Brendan? Yeah. So, uh, I would say that insider threat is definitely different than external threats because, of, like I said, the the things that might be uh, that triggered them, uh, the access and assets that we give them, the trust that we give them. So, I kind of broke it down. So, whenever people do investigations and they want to do collection, try to fill these uh, boxes. And it'll help them understand why something happened a little bit better. Because that structure is not there. Where do you go right now to learn about insider threat? That, you, they, you know, they actually teach you, hey, this is where you, where you can do it, how you can do it. If there is, you can, you can tell me. I just, I don't personally know of it right now. <laughs> you know? Mark, do you know of one that has this kind of a structure? No, I don't. I don't, actually. Yeah. This is, uh, this is great. Actually, yeah. I can see this is, uh. I don't know, EJ, was this like, a, could you use this as you're building out, like in the chain of custody, as you're looking at all the um, forensics that you're pulling? Is this the kind of thing you, you could use? Uh, if, if you're pulling forensics, look, these are your, these are your motivator uh, approaches. So yeah. if you're trying to build intent and you were going to create a, a, um, a case against an individual, you would be identifying each element of these, these elements. Your chain of custody would be your evidence uh, separate, um, and that would be tracked on how you track it. But... Yeah. If you wanted to use it back, like, you know, we've got the catalyst versus the motivator. One of the biggest things in the criminal side of looking at this type of stuff, or even if you're doing civil side, folks, if you're trying to bring charges, is you've got to look at the motivation and the intent of the person to actually have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's on every cop show under the sun of, oh, he intended to do it. No, he didn't really intend to do it. I mean, every law and order has somebody cross over every once in a while or, or blue bloods. That's your... <laughs> This would be a, a checkbox style of approach if you really needed to do it as you're putting these. If your job is to actually prosecute and or confront the person doing it rather than just stop them. Yeah. Yeah, I would. So, so I'll go through just right. a quick overview. But here we're talking about the number one thing is the employee that you're looking at. Right. You want to find out where they fired, where they put on uh, notice that they're going to get terminated, that they'll be leaving soon. Are they currently you know, it employed or are they maybe uh, a contractor? Uh, their role itself is what do they do for the company? And what that does is that's going to spill you out into, well, now we got to understand what they're capable, capable of doing, their skill sets they have, their certifications and everything. What's the access that we provide them? You know, what can they do with that access uh, in their skill set? And that's it. The asset itself, this is what most people get stuck in, is they just look at the technical. They're going to look at what's the, what's the system that they're using, what, what do we see from our tools, and what, what behaviors, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they're pivoting, maybe they're doing whatever. What's the vulnerability that, uh, that exists possibly that let them get in it? Because that's a big indicator, too, because you've got to go, well, how do I fix this in the future? There's your leadership, right? Then we got to talk about the mm -hmm. human itself, and this is a big, uh, big component that I like, and because I, I easily understand the human nature, basically. So, catalyst in this sense is we're going, what was the change in the environment that made them change and uh, that motivated them? Was it that their uh, work that they'd done had been taken over, wasn't appreciated? Uh, maybe somebody, you know, they're low on money. Maybe they have to, you know, you got to figure out what is the thing that's changing their environment that makes the behavior change and, they're, and the way that they're supposed to operate normally. And, of course, motivation, you figure it out. Yeah, they got fired. Yeah, they, uh, they, they are how they perceive uh, and react to that change. Like, what are they, they going to do, you know? And then we'll look at what they're doing. Are they showing up late? Are they, are they changing around past? Uh, passwords and creds and all that. Are they getting into the systems they're not supposed to? Are they asking for passwords? Are they are they piggybacking through through certain access? What? And then we're going to break it down by ends, ways, and means. And if you're in military, three letter C, you've heard that before. You got to figure out what's their end state, 
how they're doing it with the capability that they have and uh, with the means that they're doing it. In methodology, we go to TTPs, you look at MITRE and you break it down and you identify the threat. It's just, it's easier for them to fill these boxes and everybody get on the same hive mind kind of situation. And, and it worked out for us and, and, and I, I just preached here. Well, I mean, here's, here's something that we often forget about and to this, to the point of what Daniel's put in here is that so much of, um, the approach is to stop the insider is to understand what they took and what they did. So little of it is to understand why it happened. You can't defend against somebody or something unless you understand their motivation and their, uh, their, their motivation at the time of which the action is taking place. Um, and, you know, like you said, some of that can just be stupid. Um, you know, I just needed to get the work done, so I stuck it on box so everybody could download it. All right. Their motivation was to get the work done. They didn't see the risks that were associated with it. Done. Okay. Now we know how to fix that. We block the box. We, we don't allow this to happen, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. it, we have an individual who's about to get fired and they know it's, you know, two weeks from now. If they know they're going to get fired in two weeks, why are you letting them in the system for two weeks? Uh, I'm sorry. You either get rid of them or don't get rid of them. You don't, it doesn't work that way anymore. We just have too much access of things that we can do all the way through. I mean, I'm guilty of it. I know that I'm leaving a company or whatever. I will go and clean out my computer. I know exactly what I'm going to take. I know what, yep. what's there. Um, and if you as a company know, shut it down. Um, you know, and you can then sit and work with the individual. And here's uh, people argue, oh, well, that'd take too much time to sit and do that. No, it doesn't take too much time. All right. I know what I want out of documents. I maintain a folder called personal. Everything in personal leaves with me. Everything else stays behind. So, you know, that, so motivation is a very, very big piece. Um, and we don't think about that most times in terms of incident response. We think about it after the fact. Um, but if you're going to defend against it, you got to understand why they're doing it. I would say if, if, okay, for FBI and your investigative file, in your first paper, you have to write, I think it's a section one, right? Where if I have it correct, if I'm wrong, tell me. But I think section one uh, says, why did this investigation start? What was the thing that kicked off this entire thing? If I, if I have that correct. And, and we don't annotate that enough and think about from that point, I, I think that a lot of people will look at like, what is, what is the bad that we saw right away? You know, and, and they don't go back and go, yeah. okay, well, what, yeah. What's the status of this person and why did they do it? And, you know, what's the, what's the motivation? What did we do to them that made them want to make that decision? So. Well, you have to justify why an investigation would be open in any law enforcement agency and in some regards. And, and some will just let it fly, but usually if it's a federal level, there's a, there's a clear justification. What was the overt act that occurred? What was involved? And to a large extent, is it prosecutable? which means was there truly intent associated with it? And you'd be surprised at how many companies, and I've been out of the Bureau over 10 years now, but you'd be surprised at how many companies come forward and say, this happened, and it was somebody from inside and took it, and the, and the response is, well, what do you want us to do? Do you want them arrested? Do you want, well, no, I don't want them arrested. Then why are you asking the law enforcement to get involved? <laughs> you, know, um, I, you know, and when I do it as a, as a consultant, well, what is your end goal? Is your, is your intention to figure out why it happened so we can stop it? Is it to make somebody pay? Is it to minimize the, the risk and liability to you if it goes public? What is your end goal? And very rarely people don't understand that. And I know this, we've kind of gone on a tangent away from insider threat, but this is any threat to a company when something happens, um, understanding what that is and then what do you want to do? Mark? That's a great I was about to ask you that. I mean, how many companies effectively don't want to take that kind of action because they don't want the publicity and the reputational damage? I, you know what? In, in my, I, I joined the Bureau in 99, so 21 years. I've been out 10 years, but, you know, 10 plus years of, of consulting work. 95% of the companies that I deal with, either with, within law enforcement or outside, do not want it to go public. 
And the reason is because they think it will somehow harm their business. And the truth is, in today's environment, it really doesn't. I mean, we have no. what's called breach fatigue. The world the world <laughs> knows that everybody's going to get breached. Um, yeah. But the, the, uh, the, the biggest differentiator was interesting. So as an agent, I come in and I say, I want to know this, 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 this. All right, we got a whole list of things that you're supposed to get. You give it to the client, the client, or I call them clients now, but the victim at the time, and they, they wait and they wait. And they wait. I'm like, well, we can't do anything until you share this information. And they wait. So when I left the bureau and I started talking with clients that way and became who became clients, they're like, we just didn't have it. We just don't have what law enforcement's asking about. We don't have the logs. We don't have the insight. Uh... We don't have the capability. Daniel just laid out this great chart of things. Um, and with where he is employed, he has the ability to see some of this, but... 95% of the companies don't even have it. And it, it, you know, look at the current situations that are happening in terms of cyber attacks. Leave them away from insider threats. And let's yep. call, I'm going to call phishing in insider threats. You get the, the pastor. They can't even find that. They can't find the original email that somebody clicked on that caused this to happen for, I don't know why. So. Yeah. You know, there was another point too, Daniel, when you were showing your, your um, framework that came up is the criticality of offboarding, right? So EJ, you talked about, you know, the employee who you're going to fire in two weeks or, you know, is imminently quitting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as you said, right, like pay them out, you know, they're gone, disable access. I've seen that as well, where, you know, uh, particularly on the administrative side, employees leave and the company's not using, you know, some kind of like access or privilege access management tool. And so, you know, they were, everybody knows they still know the password to like the web server, right? And they don't, mm -hmm. you know, and they can't change it because it's, you know, literally, you know, ironically written down somewhere um, and all the admins know it, right? And it's, you know, A, disaster that all of them know it because they don't need to, um, but B, that they're using that kind of fragile type of system or even months later, their personal creds are still active, right? If that was, um, <laughs> I dealt with a law firm probably three, four years ago now who had fired a senior administrator and months later came back and they destroyed all their uh, their backups in their email server. Now that actually was, uh, that's actually a case you can read about now, right? Um, and that's, that's just crazy because that is just such a simple checklist kind of item. But the reality is most companies don't, um, they, they don't do it, right? They don't have enough process around that to make sure. And it's being handled by non-security people, right? It's the HR department. Right. So the HR department lets somebody go and perhaps you get that email that says, you know, John is no longer with the company. We thank them for their years of service. And that's kind of it. And, you know, they've disappeared in the middle of the night and the dots haven't been connected to make sure that whatever privileged access they had has been revoked. Or, like I said, what intellect, what um, institutional knowledge they have that, you know, they can then expose. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned would, HR. My wife is in HR. And... Go ahead. As is mine. <laughs> go ahead, Daniel. I was going to say, in, in, for leaders, I think uh, there's a, uh, an important there's an important thing that I use, and it's called don't go into a room yelling. Uh, as a former team sergeant, yes, that's a very important trait to keep, you know, that, that kind of stoic mentality. Maybe you see something in alert, and you're you're about to, you know, raise hell, and, and, and you realize, oh, we're just testing this environment. Oh, I was given this access. And we're just we're just trying to fix something here. You may not be able as a leader be able to wrap your head around, and this is why you have analysts and and, and uh, people advising you in, in those roles. Is that you're gonna go? Okay, I can't wrap my head around every single aspect of Intel, DLP, whatever. So make sure that you're not just gonna look at these tools and go, oh my gosh, here's an anomalous behavior. Let me let me get after them and start you know burying my employee because they may not be an insider threat. Maybe they're just doing something that's anomalous, and you got to go. Okay, let me slow down before I come in here and start accusing my employees of doing this because that'll create an insider threat quicker than anything. So you, you you do have to be careful. Don't go into a room yelling. Yeah, yeah. knee jerk reaction. We, I mean, as soon as we see something bad, we think the world's coming down and so on. And I, you, you nailed it on something, Daniel, that I agree with. You are not, you cannot be an expert in computers. There is no such thing as an expert in computers. Yeah. Maybe you understand one little bit. 
all right? Maybe you understand a couple of different bits. I mean, I've been doing this for a while, and I understand a lot of a little, but I can't, I can't do it anymore. I mean, I used to have a team of forensic guys that worked for me, and I'd sit down and I'd want to do the forensics, and they'd literally come and push my chair away and go, you're just too slow. You're not allowed to do this anymore, all right? But I'm like, but I know. And they're like, no, you don't know anymore. You're just, and I'm Googling it. The, my point is that it, it, to Daniel's point, you, you come into a room yelling or whatever. You got to understand what's really happening. You got to take a look at the whole of the environment. You may know you're one little piece, um, but anytime um, <laughs> I use the, the definition of expert that uh, a military, I'm a former Marine brat or I'm a Marine brat. My father passed away. Um, you know, an expert is X as in former, spurt as in shot of water or something that disappeared very quickly. So either way, it means nothing to be an expert because it was before and it's disappeared by now. So um, just just be leery of that, folks, too. So, man, we've gone all over from from. Uh... <laughs> Go ahead, Brandon. Hey, hey, don't worry. Yeah. I'll bring you back. Okay. Don't worry. All right. Bring us back. <laughs> I, I got I got this uh, ship here, <laughs> so my I, kind of winding down. Um, I would I would ask the next question, which is three parts. I would say so. Where does this layer of security with insider threat land in terms of priority um, and the security program's maturity model? Um, and you mentioned earlier responsibility. So like whose responsibility would this also fall under within the security team? Let's get Daniel start on that one. Yeah, sure. So, uh, <laughs> I would say that it's imperative that, okay, well, we want to talk maturity model. Okay. Uh, because I've done this too, discovery for in, 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 Intel CTI programs. Um, it's easy to sit here and rely on your tool, that you the tools that you have, and just you know collect your check and move on. Um, you have to find people that are passionate about it, and and you know just let them geek out. I would say one of the big differences with. Uh, you can have your insider threat program, the monitoring part. You could also have an Intel program that exists for that. I think the first part of your question, I would say, how many, how many of these activities, uh, what 65% of, of threats are mostly insider, is it, if, that, if I remember correctly. Um, and it depends on how you categorize it, because we categorize the one that was, uh, if it's fishing, it's technically an insider threat because you're, you're doing that. You're convincing somebody to do something for you with the inside. So as far as maturity models, have your monitoring, have your investigative part. Try to introduce, and I know this is a new concept, try to introduce Intel in it. Because if you're a big company, you got a lot of uh, bubbles within your bubble. You want to uh, understand things holistically. You want to understand campaigns. You want to understand if there's a group within another part of your, another region, another country, what have you and understand what their behaviors are that you can change uh, with that. Because if you go hunting, and I use this analogy, if I go hunting, I don't hunt for Bob the deer. I hunt based on, I know where they drink, I know where they walk, I know that these deer and this is the behaviors. And that's why I talk a lot about patterns of life, human indicators, and so on. So Intel, find yourself an Intel guy, a lot of people getting out of the military, they have that education. They have that mindset to understand things for what they are. Go find them. Go put them in those spots and move on because you're going to be successful. You're going to have a good maturity model. I'll leave it at that. Mark, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So, you know, you're right. If we include humans in this, if we include fishing and supply chain, right, vendors and partners, then it does have to be a top priority of a, of a whatever secure, a security program that you have. And I think one of the best ways that you can kind of push that along the tracks is to work with the executives and get them involved, right? Because you want to get them out of the mindset that cybersecurity is an IT problem to solve. And more, like EJ said, it's a business risk to manage, right? So help them understand. So for example, if you are using, let's say, a traditional insider kind of, you know, sabotage or theft type of threat, 
then walk through that scenario as a tabletop and have them understand, like, are you prepared? Can you collect the forensics that you would need to potentially hand over to law, uh, law enforcement for prosecution, right? Are you willing to make it a public matter? Because as soon as that happens, you know, you've got public records that are now available that someone might find to realize that this has occurred, right? Do you understand what your legal obligations are and what your legal um, limitations are, right? So you get a, we were talking about, uh, EJ, when you talked about the police or, you know, watching police programs, law enforcement, and everybody thinks they're an expert and they understand the Miranda Act and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, the, you know, the devil's in the details, right? And you see the same thing in HR as an example or at the executive level where suddenly everybody has a law degree. Right. And they they think they understand what they can or cannot do. And, you know, you overshoot the mark and the next thing you know, that employee is, you know, turning around on you. And and as I've, I've written about, you know, as soon as you do this to a vendor, as soon as you do that to an employee, you have to assume that they will go defensive. Right. If I think I'm being investigated for for corporate theft, I'm going to get a lawyer. And the first thing my lawyer is going to do is say, shut up. Right. Stop talking. And now you're in that position. If you go to a supply chain vendor and you say, you guys screwed up bad, we break, you know, we're, you've, you've, uh, we're canceling our contract with you. They'll do the same thing. Right. So figure out what those, you know, figure out what the business factors look like, because there's sort of those um, knock on effects that you don't think are going to happen until you kind of test them out. And as you go through that process, that's where you start to go. Oh, yeah, you're right. We better get our general counsel involved in this one or we need to figure this out. Or, you know, at what point do we contact law enforcement? Do we do this when what did you say? What was it? Your uh, just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Right. Is it that point or is it when we've actually got some evidence or, you know, maybe we tricked the person. Right. We put out uh, a honeypot and they came to it. Right. And now, you know, now we're more convinced that there is something nefarious going on. If, yeah. if I could head on um, to that right quick, um, we're sorry. Uh, if you do have an insider threat intel program, or even the if you in the program itself, uh, regular insider threat um, investigative part, can you reach out to your leadership and maybe the C suite and have what we, what, well, we would call intelligence requirements for us, but you can call them uh, key objectives. Things that the leadership wants to know instead of sending out ad hoc requests and coming by your desk and be like, hey, I just read this thing in the newspaper. I would like to know more about it if it's a problem for us and the insider threat. Why don't, you, why don't you set up and refine questions for your leadership? You know, hey, what's important to you? What do you, what do you think is, is, a, is a concern? Because they're sitting at the top and they're getting everybody's voices that they can get. And maybe some positivity bias that goes along with that. But, uh, you know, your leadership might have uh, a little bit of insight for what the other teams are thinking and ask the right question. So set up some, some, uh, uh, key, key, re key requests of, of what's important, not just ad hoc and refine that list and answer those things for, uh, you know, how many people are downloading to personal, uh, storage devices from their, from their network system, uh, you know, things of that sort. So, you can you can reach out. You don't just have to do what you're told. You can ask for 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 help from your leadership and and getting them to uh, mature your program a little bit. I think that would definitely help. Yeah, okay. I was gonna um, uh, jump in with this and that. You, Brendan, you asked how how prevalent this is. Well, it ninety percent, eighty five percent, depending on how you categorize it, fishing at it and whatever. It is so prevalent that the NIST 800-171 standard, which is required for all of DOD contractors, which is the base level for what's called CMMC, which is required for all government contractors. Section 3.2.3, it's on my screen over here, literally <laughs> says you have training about insider threat. All right, not training about information security. It says that somewhere else. It says it includes insider threat they insider. call it out specifically now granted this is the dod and they're worried about counterintelligence work and so on but if it's that important that it is a call out in, and it is one of the 110 controls or uh, one of the 130 cmmc controls that's how important it truly is all right um because it is not something that is readily available to understand all the way through and to to daniel's point um, in terms of your, your maturity, you under you must have the intelligence to understand what is baseline and what is anomalous. You must have the the understanding of 
You have to have people who think this way. All right. One of the biggest problems for law enforcement along the line has always been that they don't think like bad guys. All right. Or like, or, or even people doing this type of work. If you don't yeah. think like the bad guy, if you don't say, if I was a bad guy, what would I do? And trust me, it takes years to figure out to really be a bad guy and think it all the way through the right way. You'll miss a lot of this junk. And, and you need somebody who's been trained up and understands to think outside of your standard. Oh, this is how it works because like the guy who just wants to make things work or the gal that just wants to make things work. This isn't sexist. It could be anybody. Um, they don't think risk. They, they trust people and military guys and gals or even ex law enforcement. We're, we're paranoid. We're simply paranoid. That's just the way it is. And paranoia is a portion of maturity in this regard. Um, and you have to educate up to your senior management to get them a little paranoid because the loss of that intellectual property, um, I'll be real quick. And I know, I know Brendan, we were talking about um, you being from South Africa at one point in time. I, I, one of the cases I worked was the theft of the South African diamond mine site holder records and site S I T E. Um, and this is the, the, the uh, rocks they get out of the ground and, you know, what level of diamond they are. The initial approach was no big deal. It's a rock coming out of the ground. All right. And, and what's it worth and so on. But with, when you look at it, there's only a limited number of, quote, site holders that can see this. And they can say, oh, that one's worth more than that. And the government gets an automatic percentage of it. And they know what the market's going to bear from it. There is so much follow on from knowing that initial piece of information that you don't even think and people don't even think about the risk associated with it. And we, we need to, we need people who do that. That's your maturity level who see that, but don't let those who are paranoid or have the risk mindset rule the roost. Their job is to bring the risk to your mind, share it with you. And then to Mark's point, I'm seeing, I'm trying to wrap everybody's together to Mark's point, apply it to the business. <laughs> Because sometimes you just have to accept risk in business. That's part of doing business. Um, you just have to accept it and say, this is what we're going to do. Other questions, Brendan, as we wrap up our time? Yeah, this is the last one. So to wrap up, like for companies wanting, you know, to address this and don't know where to start, what advice would you give them? Any pitfalls that they could avoid? Pitfalls to avoid. Daniel, you're in the thick of it every day. What, what's a pitfall to avoid? Don't do Godzilla theories. What I mean by that is some things might seem exciting to chase down. If you don't have the information to back it off, don't don't go with it. What's that Occam's razor? You know, the, if, if it's simple, it makes the most sense, go with it. Um, I've had people say, give me analysis that I'm just like, where did you even start with this? And you can get lost within your investigation and be like, where did I get this bit of information? Oh, I thought I had it here. I didn't annotate it. I didn't take notes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's one of the big pitfalls is definitely don't, don't go into uh, Godzilla theory and Try to try. I know it's hard to teach grit. Daniel, you break up. Yeah. Daniel, you break up right on the key term. Don't go into the. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so don't don't go into it again. Go ahead and start, say yeah, that again. Don't go into don't go into God. Tune in next yeah, week. Don't don't go into Godzilla theory, and it's hard to teach grit, but it, it's an important thing. I think anybody who has grit uh, will know what they got to do and 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 do it. Uh, Watch out for check collectors. They they're not good for your business. Just get them out of that team. But when you're yeah. when your number one job is telling the truth and the absolute truth and no biases, find somebody with grit. Yeah, uh, a share on that. The Godzilla theory. Is, you know, it must be a Godzilla attack right off the bat. Um, there was a uh, aircraft that got knocked down that went down um, years and years ago. I, it was during the time I was with the bureau, and um, a lot of people were certain that it was a missile attack. Um, this was off the coast of uh, New England. And um, I know an agent was actually removed because the questions that were asked of the witness, because it was actually written down, 
is not what mm -hmm. did you see, but which direction did the missile come from? That's the first question. Oh, wow. Well, when you start with that question in mind, oh, well, the, the FBI guy just told me there was a missile. So I saw it coming from this direction over here. You got to you got to have that same approach to 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 my point on it. Um, uh, you know, how do you avoid an insider threat? Understand your people. Uh, take the time to actually to to know who your people are, what they're doing, what's involved. Build a relationship, uh, your people, your vendors, your groups, not just some random group on online. But, you know, and I'm not talking about you got to go out and have drinks with them every Friday or, you know, cheer on a, a football team or whatever. I'm talking about at least know who they are. Ask how their life is going. Ask where they're living. Ask where, you know, how are their kids? Um, things like that. Because you are, people are less likely to fall for and or hurt somebody they trust or they're a part of if they feel that it will, uh, that they're hurting a friend. Um, they really will. It just, it, if it's in their mind, um, they, they just are unlikely to do it. Um, because that's one of the things they play on is why would you, why are you doing this for this company? They, they treat you like crap. They don't pay you enough. They don't do this. That's how the bad guys play on them to get it. And if you actually go, well, actually they do. I mean, I get, I can take off time whenever I want. And, you know, the CEO actually knows my name and says hi to me. And, you know, we, our kids played it totally different environment. That's my, my advice. And it's, you know, on a personal level and Mark. Interesting. Yeah, so I'm going to add to your self-fulfilling prophecy about you know if you if you if you lead the witness with the uh, with the assumption that there was a missile, um, same thing. Don't create you know sort of um, self-fulfilling prophecies you know that are based on you know frankly you know being uh, penny wise and and dollar foolish, right? So I've seen multiple companies over the last year who you know refused to um, assign equipment to employees working from home so they ended up completing their tasks on personal devices right in one case it was an engineering firm and the laptops they bought them uh, weren't were insufficient to actually run the programs they needed to do their jobs so what did they do they went home and they they used their own equipment and now you're in a beat be, you know, not even bring your own device it's just your own device completely off the grid it was all shadow IT and of course it led to a, a major breach right so you know, again, back to that risk. Yes, I know that was an expensive. Um, I'm sure it was expensive to buy all those laptops at the same time. It certainly was a fraction of the cost of the event. Right. So just look at it holistically. Look at your entire program. Um, don't look at one specific, you know, piece and, and make that kind of snap decision without really understanding what the, as I said before, you know, the knock on effect or the secondary effect of that decision. Yeah, might be. I get a laugh at that one, because when I started in the bureau and they got a, and oh. I got assigned to um to cybercrime or started working on it, the bureau, you, there was no internet computers in our offices. And, and when I actually got one in and brought it in, um, we had to, we had to hide it, uh, in terms of a, in terms of the charge for the government, because we weren't allowed to have internet in the office, but I couldn't communicate with the bad guys and identify them unless I was on the internet. So how do you chase bad guys <laughs> that are doing cybercrime? So I literally did it from my home. And I got in trouble for it. I'll admit, uh, they, you know, but I followed all the rules of evidence. I created all the things that I needed to do yeah. and so on. And none of that went into actually court cases. But that's the only way you had to do it. Um, but again, that goes back to understanding, you know, what, what, the, what the people need, understanding your groups across the board yeah. uh, and eliminating that, that threat approach uh, or that need for them to, to fall into this category. Um, some would say pay them more money. I get it. You can't, but there's, you know, there's other ways to make people feel valued at a company and money's not the only one. I think, so. I think one, one of the good examples. Brandon, we get all your questions. Awesome. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. Go ahead. One, one good example is uh, he's being charged with a lot of interpreters and I kept getting complaints that uh, information was getting leaked out and, and nobody can understand why. And I said, did you guys think about taking away their cell phones? But that, that would be a good idea. If we don't think about the <laughs> pattern of life and, and going, yeah. okay, what is something that this person does when they're not at work? Why are we worried? We're looking at what they're doing oh, during, you know what? I, I worked at Black during the regular Sorry. times of office hours, but we don't think about what they do when they go home. And so, like, God took away their cell phones and all those problems disappeared, you know? And a little bit of uh, supervision, and, and you solve that problem. So, yeah. go ahead, Mark. Sorry. 
Yeah. 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 I worked years ago at BlackBerry real quick. And, you know, it was like, you know, the iPhone when the new devices were coming, they'd all get leaked. And like the top of the company, Mike Lazaridis is screaming about the fact that new designs got leaked out and they got all these security controls on the, you know, on the campus. And literally at one point we're sitting in me and I go, yeah, so all you have to do is walk down to the Starbucks down the street because all the interns are there with the latest, you know, beta devices in line buying their coffee. So pretty much if I'm a reporter, I go sit at the table in the Starbucks and I just take pictures of people walking in and I can, you know, I know what they yeah. are. Right. Um, and it was just so patently obvious, but that, you know, whatever the top of the ivory tower had no idea what yeah, was going the, on. You can end it with this. Cause we, <laughs> you know, look, we our job, our jobs as all of us, is you know we are looking at the bad stuff happening and i don't want the people and the listeners thinking that the world is ending because of this this is a real threat it's a real risk it's always going to be there it's never going to go away it's been around since the dawn of time you know one caveman sees another caveman using a knife and goes oh how do i steal that next thing you know you know we have weapons it is what it is don't don't freak out about it recognize that it's a risk and and um and build control so you can see when something actually happens and learn from the motivations associated with it. I mean, I, I, I hate ending on a negative note, um, so we're not going to do that. Positive, we are aware of it. You're listening to a podcast to understand about this. So, you know, that's the education. We're, we're stronger because we listen to all this stuff and we learn from each other. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it was uh, a great session. I really appreciate all the, the insights and I'm sure our audience will too. Um, if anyone listening right now has any follow-up questions or would like to connect with any of you, uh, what's the best way for them to connect? Uh, we can also add, you know, your links to your whatever in, in the show notes. My, my email um, account is out there, but, you know, find me on LinkedIn. That's the easiest yeah. to start off with and then we'll build from there. Yeah, LinkedIn's the best. And don't try to sell me anything through LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Go, goes without saying. Daniel, LinkedIn for you, or is there a different I'll... way you want to connect? Daniel doesn't want to connect with anybody. Huh? Yep. <laughs> I'll take it as a yes. LinkedIn. So we'll we'll add them in the show notes. Um so thanks everyone for taking the time to join us today on Cybersecurity Heroes and to the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye. That's a wrap for this episode of Cybersecurity Heroes, practical and experiential knowledge on a day in the life of security heroes. Catch our next episode by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating for the show. They really help a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.